standing in Berkeley Street. Feeling from the community is they want. The comes after a call by the students initiated in. Hello and welcome to today's news update. I am Sinalo Tugu. And I'm Samantha Krolis, and you are watching Makanda News. These are your headlines. Makanda Local Library has been without internet for seven months. 14 immigrant owned shops looted in Joza Extension 7 and 8. Recent roadworks have residents wondering if there's hope for Grandson's infrastructure, while concerned citizens of Ghost Town do the heavy lifting in repairing their own roads. And joining us later in studio, we have community member Mbulalo Lipile and Mtutuze Limtlaba discussing service delivery in the Grahamstown community. Later, other local news stories, spots, and entertainment news. The fall of Rhodes Titans and what's on the agenda for the rest of the week. Now into our first story. Grahamstown is regularly disrupted by governmental delays. The Makana libraries have had no internet access. Reporter Sinalo Tuku investigates the effects of this. The past few months have been a roller coaster for 22 public libraries in the Sarah Bartman district in Grahamstown. These libraries have been reported to have been operating without internet since November 2017. We speak to Assistant Director of the Magana Library Services, Patricia Angelo, on this issue. No, we don't have internet. It just stopped and we didn't know what was happening. There were rumors that they did not pay the, the, the bill to, to the service provider. But when we asked them what was the reason, because we didn't have internet, they told us that uh, they were not happy with the service provider that was mm. being used by Uru National Library. So we're losing membership, and we, we, we even those that come to the library, which we sometimes have to research, for them, information that they are looking for, we can't. They said maybe by April we would have internet, but we still do not have. Users are also feeling the increased costs of having to use the internet elsewhere. It means we have to look for another alternative by means of uh, going and buy some data and all that stuff, or going to some places where you can get access from Wi-Fi and all that stuff. So it means it uh, needs uh, from us some resources. The consequences of this issue has had a negative impact on local schools around Magana. Principal and teacher of Nathaniel Nyaluza Senior Secondary School, Mr. Zagunze Madiala, speaks on this. Inavailability of internet here at Nyaluza specifically has impacted negatively uh, when it comes to the studies of our learners because they have to make means to go and find out, um, maybe they have to pop out some money uh, which they don't have uh, to get some information in the form of maybe going to the internet cafes. Sometimes they will be required to submit a project at a certain time, but then not all of them will be able to meet that deadline and that impacts negatively on our, our administration and, and our results. The Department of Sports, Recreation and Arts and Culture is responsible for paying the services that provides internet to the libraries. We then spoke to spokesperson Andy Lenduna, who had this to say. The department has made aware, uh, actually has made provision uh, on this current financial year to, make, to incorporate um, the budget for, for, for this contract for the internet services for the library. In this new financial year, we will be able to to incorporate uh, such services. We are looking at uh, before the end of June to have all services, uh, internet services, that is uh, available in all our libraries as, as per um, the initial uh, plan that we had uh, in our library. At the moment, schools and librarians are still struggling with the burden of the lack of internet access in Magana libraries. Teachers can't do their research while learners can't access information. Their only hope is for Deseret to resume internet connection by the end of June, as promised. I am Sinalo Tugu, RTV News, Gramstown. Gramstown community members are also faced with troubles that stem from within the communities themselves. 
on Tuesday the 24th of April, a protest against poor infrastructure was overshadowed by shop lootings. Our reporter, Masitemba Sazana, went to investigate community members' reactions to the looting incident. On the 24th of April, 14 immigrant-owned shops in Extension 6 and 7 were looted by groups. The looting happened during legal demonstrations by civic organizations and taxi associations. Local police, public order police and private security companies responded to calls for help by shop owners. After previously suffering from xenophobic looting in 2015, immigrant shop owners were vigilant moving their stocks the day before the marches. We spoke to a community member who helped a shop owner, Mr. Shalam Khan, move his stock. We spoke to a community member who participated in the March for Better Service Delivery who has chosen to remain anonymous. It is a strike that has nothing to do with my friend whatsoever, but it strikes us because I can for his service charges. Only those perpetrators have the advantage and they have my friend. Nikhat Ali's shop was looted in 2015 and 2018. He tells us on both occasions his shop was vandalized and he has lost everything as a result. On the time, whatever we have in the shops, the shop was closed, including the fridges, the people take the fridges, everything, unless the shelves, they broke it. They make the, oh, everything is damaged in the shop. I'm staying here since from 2007. Whatever I make since from that day, I lose in the one day. The people also don't want to want the foreigner here, because uh, when they need help, when we do the help, they say it's fine. After five minutes, they don't need. We spoke to Mbule Lolipil at the chairperson of South African Foreign Integration Committee, which was created to integrate locals and immigrants. He believes the lack of service delivery leads to conflict between the two. We're tired already of Suffolk. We decided that in the last meeting we have, that it is not good that we must always be re-established and live in fear. We need all the people who have applied for the march to be held accountable for all the impact that happens to the shops. Without the shops, there's no good life. Without the taxes, there's no good life. Without the service delivery, there's no good life. Everything is, is, is very important on the wheel because once you break one, you don't get the other. The general feeling from the community is they want the immigrant shop owners to keep working in the community. They believe the looting was a result of criminal work. Many of the shop owners declined speaking to us, fearing for their safety and their businesses. Reporting for Makanda News, Masitembe Sazana, Grahamstown. One of the biggest problems with Grahamstown infrastructure is the state of the roads. Due to the number of potholes in the town, groups of committee members have formed to repair the roads themselves. Makanda Revive is one such group. Our reporter, Bujane Green, spoke to Grahamstown residents about their experiences with the potholes. Also, chairperson of Makana Revive, Rob Weisenberg, describes the municipal shortcomings that lead to the infrastructure issues. We are standing in Beaufort Street, which has just received a fresh coat of tar. Residents of Makana can be pleased to know that something is finally being done about the infrastructure of Grahamstown. As chairperson of a civil organization named Makana Revive, Weisenberg shares his sentiments about the financial urgency that Grahamstown experiences. Well, the roads are in a bad condition as a result of many years of poor management and not making adequate financial provision for the maintenance and upkeep. We spoke to various residents around the Grahamstown residential area. Chloe Osmond expresses her views towards the municipality. The municipality is retiring the Beaufort Street Road, but it's because it's a big street, it's where there's a lot of traffic. And the problem is really bad in a lot of residential areas and maybe even on the outskirts of town. And the municipality doesn't seem to be doing anything much about that yet. The puddle in our street is an example of one that can't be fixed by community members. And that's why it's still here. That's why it's been here for so many months. Um, is because it's also a water issue. Residents don't really have 
the expertise to fix municipal water lines. So it's been here since the beginning of the year and I, I can't imagine how much water is being wasted. The, the community shouldn't be being tasked with their own service delivery. As a resident and local taxi driver within the Grahamstown community, Riyani feels as though no effort is being put into the outskirts of Grahamstown. So, festival. In a recent visit to Grahamstown last week, the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Zweli Mkize, looked into infrastructure. Weisenberg mentions this. Our feeling is it is uh, a pity that we did not have the correct skills and capacity in the municipality to recognize the need for making provision for the future, financial provisions. Uh, we do not have the hundreds of millions of rands. Central government, in fact the minister uh, Zwilim Kizi was here yesterday together with a huge delegation uh, saying that we would not get the billions we need, but uh, hopefully we'd get something. Having received the necessary pressure from the community and local businesses of Makana, the road work endeavours is finally underway. Only time will tell for the residents of Makana, because as we know, this can only be done bit by bit. I am Bijne Green, and this is Rhodes University. In the face of municipal shortcomings, Grahamstown community members have banded together proactively. Reporter Ethelyn Shakira spoke to community members who are repairing their own roads. A group of concerned citizens from Ward 3 and 4 have come together to embark on a project to repair the roads of their community, also known as Ghost Town. Uh, I grew up in this community. A lot of people did a lot of things for me, my family. So that is actually the main motivation that actually made us to take this commitment, a decision to do what we can do. We want to eradicate the problem because we always had tire problems, ball joints. But we are here, a non-political group that would like to uplift our community, the needs and look after and assist where we can in the community. As you can see, their work comes as a result of their battle with Makana Municipality to take action. We cannot wait until things are, have changed and, and we sometimes you need to start and, and, and uh, you know, initiate the change. And seeing that the circumstances of the country and the government and the, com and the different communities in South Africa uh, has driven us to, to take up the space. Well, we, we have a few guys working, doing the actual work of, on, on, on closing the roads and fixing the potholes. And you can also see that the, the difference in those guys' attitude and their behavior. Instead of now maybe going early in the morning to go and have a smoke or look for a smoke, they will report for work and the whole day we will keep them busy. And after a full day's work, you can see the satisfaction on their faces. Although the work on site is supervised by Mr. Weston and his colleagues, volunteers from the community take part in digging up the holes and laying the concrete. We spoke to Paul Pico, one of the men who has been part of the project. The Concerned Citizens Road Repair Committee is playing their part in building a better Grahamstown. Western Duplices reflects on his most rewarding moment. I think my most uh, memorable memory so far is just the appreciation that you see from the concerned citizens, uh, community members within, within our area, uh, motorists driving past, 
and and even some of the kids that are now able to walk over and you ride on their bicycles freely. Uh, there is sometimes that you need to take ownership, and and then just just pick pick up uh, a spade and do some of the work yourself to get things going. Community initiatives such as these only prove to be sustainable when everyone comes together to develop solutions. This is Ethel and Shakira reporting from Ghost Town, Grahamstown. You are joining us now in studio with our two guests, Chairperson of the South African Foreign Integration Committee, Mbulelo Lopile, who is a Grahamstown community member who has been actively involved in improving service delivery. Mtutizele Mklaba is the current Roads and Stormwater Municipal Manager overseeing the maintenance of our roads and water. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us in the studio and welcome to Makanda News. Very good to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Mr. Lepilia, our first question is directed at you. Being the head of Suffolk, having won the Makaya um, Award for your, your, your efforts to bring about peaceful coexistence between the foreign and local shop owners, and as well for your, your efforts in bringing about peaceful, um, or the efforts in the Dignity for Water Drive, it's very clear that you have been an active community member. Um, what has been your experience with the Gramstown service delivery up to this point? Has it been a positive one, a negative one, and what are your feelings surrounding the service delivery from our municipality? Thank you. Uh, working directly in, in, inside the societies, you can feel that there is that point of feeling like people they are sidelined or they are being left behind with the issues of service delivery. That's why we are seeing protests is in March. People have started to lose confidence in our municipality. But uh, if you could look at the systems itself, we need to go back to the scoreboard, whereby for us as the Makana municipality or those who are sitting in the office to check what are the gaps and what is making all this noise and the outcry within the societies. Because the issues of portholes and the water and the water issue, it's not something that started yesterday. It's been happening quite for years. And then we've been seeing the same picture that is not changing for years. But when you go deep into, the, into our societies, because I'm based in Ward 7, like areas like Klalani, k Street, you can see that there is a hectic situation, whereby even if you're driving for, with a car at night, you can see you have a challenge. Even if you're going past one, one pothole, you won't miss the second one. So there is that outcry. You can see the state of the road is it's not good at all. Definitely. Um, Ms. Lepila is one of our very own community members. And, and what, do you, what would you, you say to our community members who are, are saying that our roads are bad and we, we need help? From the start, the process is not followed uh, accordingly, according from the start. And then so now we are in the situation now we, we are beyond our lifespan of the road. And then now at the present moment we are facing the crisis, which is around about one, the total cost of the road is around about 1.2 billion. But now we are roughly, we are roughly now the estimation, which is I was did it when I was doing my PMS, and then it's around about 645. That's, hand, that's 645 million. Mm -hmm. And especially if the community of Tramstown can work with us, let's say just to pay a little bit of a service delivery, um, I mean on revenues, and then we can have a portion of money, which means we can use it in order to, to do the repairs for the road. Because the roads are not funded. So, Mr. Club, what, what, do you, what, do, what does the municipality plan to do going forward today to, to fix the roads? I've signed a contract, I think, on, on Monday which means they're going to give us a 10 million rand to do the rehabilitation of the road of Grimstown. And, and then from there, this money is just only for the, it's mm. for the rehabilitation, just to close portals, to do the chip and spray, and then also to do the milling in some critical areas that we're going to see around the festival mm. and then around Grimstown. Because actually the festival is not only in town, it's for the whole of Grimstown. So actually we are just doing all those critical areas at the present moment. After the rehabilitation, after the festival, then we're going to start now from the basic, from the reconstruction of all the roads. So the money is there. The government, uh, to talk to them, keys a promise us around about 275, which is million. And then, but for now, it's just only for the 10 million. So when will that money come in? When can we give an answer to community members about the roads being fixed? Yeah, the, the states of the roads in town, they are not that bad. They are not that poor as the states of the, as the, states of the roads in the location. 
you see the problem that people that they don't understand, instead of coming to us as a municipality and then we sit on the table, and then we come with a discussion. Because actually for me, if you're throwing in a concrete on the tar road, there will be chemical reaction. And then there will be more problems that the community are creating. They making it more. You see, because actually now we we are at the stage now to, to go to them and then to give them a, a good service delivery according to the requirements that are supposed to be done. Um, Mr. Lepilo, would you like to weigh in on what Mr. Mfaba said about our community members aren't really fixing the roads right, about the 10,000, about only fixing um, the rest of the roads after the festival? What are your thoughts on this? Yes, I think my, uh, it's not a question, it's just something I need to get a clarity out of Mr. Mfaba when he's saying the community is not coming to the municipality to talk. What is the meaning of the protest? And then I think from what I'm hearing from what he's saying, he's talking deep in technical side. But the issue of a public participation, it seems there is still a lack there when he said the community doesn't come to talk. So there is an office that is based, is placed to talk directly to the community. Is there any gap? in talking in the issues of communication within the society and the, and the government, whereby there is no clear understanding who to talk to in order to have this service delivery, fixing the portal and the money that is there, in sharing the information, like to designate it around the societies. Then the community can be aware when this will happen and have that light of a hope, things will happen. But now it seems like it sits inside the government, not going out to the societies. The community is represented by the councillors. So as we deliver every information to the councillors. So actually the councillors, as by the rules of the council, is supposed to have a work committee every month to inform the communities what is happening. The last two meetings we had with them, it was January and February, before the start of the project. But now the people are coming with uh, our strike that you guys are fixing only Buffalo Street. Because actually, we went to the national government to Sandra to do the, to do the negotiations of the um, of the reconstruction of Offer Street. You see, because that road is a provincial road, and also Sandra, we negotiated with Sandra, then they agreed, and then there was also a a, a CEO from Sandra said, "No, I will give you when we are doing phase phase two of N two, which is going to Pedi." and then we'll give you a portion of the money. But we, we, we won't be doing the reconstruction of the road. We're just gonna do just only the, the rehabilitation stage, just to rip on the asphalt and then to put in a new asphalt layer. Now, Mr. Lepita, you're saying that, as a community member, you're saying that you do go to the municipal offices and you do put your, these are your issues that you're experiencing forward. And, and am, I, am I correct in saying that you feel like you aren't heard and the problems just sit within the offices? Yes, because the point of clarity was about the issue of communication, so whereby technically they have their systems in place. Mm. But how does that effectively communicate to the societies? Mr. Mkhabi, would you like to, to respond to that? About yes, the, to respond the, to that. Yes. Because actually I think um, we had a lot of imbuzos for the past two months, which is we're going to each ward. And then we, we inform them what projects are coming in, uh, how much money that is going to be spent uh, on water, and then also on sanitation, and then also on roads, the money that we're expecting that actually the provincial government or the national government, and then that can give, that can give to us in order to do the repairs mm -hmm. for the road. So it's not that people are unaware. All the operations of the municipality, mm -hmm. it depends on the revenue collection that we're collecting in terms of. This is what we're saying to the people. If the people, they can at least pay 200 bucks the end of the end of the month or three hundred bucks, that is not a huge money, you know. And then with that money, if you can calculate for the people of Grahamstown, yes. you can get around about six million, which is an extra amount, which is on that six million, mm -hmm. so, we can. So are we, um, you're asking community members to pay for their own roads to be fixed, which the municipality yes. should be fixing. But we know that most of the other people they don't have work, mm -hmm. you see. So now that is why now we're trying to go an extra mile to go to provincial and then also to go also to the president. We did try that actually we need money for the assistance in Makana. What, what I understand as a community member in Makana, the high rate of unemployment, it's very bad in Makana. And then the issue of revenue is quite a struggle when you talk of that, that the community had to pay because the people will tell you that we're not working. From the narrative collected in different projects, 
one thing you notice that is critical is the high rate of unemployment. So in terms of the government, what strategies do they have in, all, in, in order to overcome the issue of unemployment rate while balancing it with the revenue collection? So what is your response to, how do you plan to generate that money? Everything now that we have planned uh, is going according to, to what actually we want to achieve at least for this year, at least for the next five years. So I, I think the way moving forward is that we can definitely assume that on Monday the 10 million will come in, we will see the repairs, or not the repairs, the, the covering up of our potholes, and then hopefully after festival we will see um, the repairing of our townships, which is what um, our, our community members want and need yes. and are actually um, entitled to. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us in studio. Very appreciative of you giving up your time um, to, to join us. Um, that's all we have time for. Here we conclude our discussion on service delivery and move on to other local stories. Taking steps towards transformation, Rhodes University finalizes name changes for three of its residences. Students living off campus question their safety after kidnapping incidents. Two years later, we reflect on the hashtag Ari reference list protests and Rose University SRC celebrates the life of Winnie Matikizela Mandela. Recently, Grahamstown residents felt threatened after kidnappings involving Rhodes University students. Many Opidon students are left wondering if they are being protected. Some suspects of these robberies and kidnapping cases have been taken into custody. Sosipo Nsabo reports on this matter. Since the beginning of February, three incidents of kidnapping and robbery have been reported to the South African Police Services in Grahamstown. This morning at the Grahamstown Magistrate Office, two men appeared before the court for abduction and robbery. These men are closely linked to the abduction of Rhodes University students. One of the accused pleaded guilty to these charges. The other decided to abandon bail. This Rhodes University student was kidnapped off of High Street during Rhodes University Orientation Week in February. He wishes to remain anonymous. I have no cash. They saw my bank card and they were like, let's go to the ATM, we need cash. That's when I told them that I don't have money in this card. That's when they made me call my mother and then I called my mom. And then I called my other uncle. My uncle put the money. When he deposited the money, we went to the ATM. I took the money out, gave them to the fan. They gave me back my phone. We are really not by roads. Maybe they should like intensify the security out of campus as well, because they have students out of campus. This anonymous source claims he has insight into how these robberies are organized. They took the money that he was going to buy, that non-existent two kgs of uh, marijuana. And then I saw these guys again on New Street. They always traveled in a pair, pulling similar stunt with yet another unsuspecting victim. These incidents have been linked to a wider drug scare in Grahamstown. Opidan students, students living off campus, are at a higher risk regarding safety and security. Opidan subwarden Leroy Maiseri explains the safety regarding these students. Opidan students beyond campus rely on, on themselves. They, they are treated like, I guess, any other community member. There are no safety mechanisms that are offered. Rhodes University Director of Student Affairs sent a statement to the student body regarding incidents involving students. Management has been unavailable for further comment on the abduction incidents. The case has been postponed to the 22nd of May, but the two still remain in custody. Sisi Ponsabo, RUTV, Grahamstown. Our reporter Sipomo Nakali reports on the name changes in three Rhodes University residences. Rhodes University celebrated the name change of three residences on April 25th. This comes after a call by the students initiated in 2015 to implement the transformation campaign at the institution. The residents include Robert Sobukwe, Charlotte Mataike, and Enoch Sondonga House. We pledge to be leaders in both our community and our academia. We pledge to embrace diversity, accept people regardless of their race, ethnicity, or social background. Given the context of the time, uh, we felt that it necessitated that we question, bring into question the history of South Africa and the institutions that we find ourselves in. And you might remember that this was in the weeks of uh, roads must fall during the 2015, uh, 2016 years. It gives us pride, I think, to know that there is a space in Rose University named after 
our ancestors. The event was attended by family members to do the unveiling of the names, students sharing different kinds of performances for entertainment. Amongst the university's management was the Chancellor Justice in Party, who gave the vote of thanks. Yeah, I'm very excited. Um, I am very proud that the students in the house took such a brave step, really, to, to articulate their experiences um, of being in a space like this, um, a space where we want to promote inclusive diversity. And it's one thing to promote, it is another thing to practice it. And I think the students are very brave to say, we're not just going to say these things, we want to see it happen. That the spirit that you have shown in driving the process of the name changes to the residences and houses at the university, you will take that energy when you go outside of the university, having finished your studies, and use it to improve the lives of our people in South Africa. Reporting from Rhodes University, Sipo Monagali. One can't talk about transformation at Rhodes without remembering RU reference list. The protest took place in April 2016. Two years later, we reflect on these events. What has changed and what has stayed the same? Reporter Bujan A. Green investigates. April 17, 2018 marked two years since the release of the RU reference list. We are standing in front of the Purple Square, a significant landmark during the days of protesting that followed. The protest saw support from the student body and the international community. Mishka Wazar, a student journalist, reflects on where student activists are two years later. I don't see anything else happening and I don't think that the student activists who are currently here are willing to go through what we went through in the past to make a dent within the system. Because if we look at what has really been changed, the university is the same. Everything is going on exactly the same. I don't see anything happening because I think we're just exhausted with the way that we're being, we're being treated. On November 2017, two student activists were excluded for life following an internal disciplinary procedure. This led to the Rhodes War, a social media campaign against the university's decision. We spoke to Yolanda Dianti, one of the expelled, who believes that she risked her future for a good cause. And yet, you see in 2017, 2018, the very same men that we stood up against um, and called for the university to take um, you know, serious measures into dealing with the issue, they get to move on with their lives, they get you know, to be good and become graduates, and our, our careers, our academic careers essentially, are put on hold and are tarnished, even publicly, you know, because the university has gone up out of its way to criminalize us, even in the media. We spoke to Sandy Siri Magadla and found out about the work that the Gender Action Project is doing in commemoration of the protests. We're hoping to um, have a solidarity stand or something in regards with the Rhodes War, specifically the Rhodes War, because our campus has not yet done anything to stand in solidarity, whereas other campuses such as UCT have, because the women in Rhodes War were part of our RU reference list, and that's the many reasons that they were excluded in this university. The Rhodes University management has received calls to attend to issues to do with rape culture, but student activists are not satisfied with the university's engagement. I am Bujne Green, and this is Rhodes University. The Rhodes University SRC screened the documentary Winnie on the 20th of April. They hope to start a conversation about what it means to be in Bogoto. They explored what they explored the struggle icon Winnie Mandela and what she represents to the present day youth. We are outside Eden Grove for the Black Women's Rage event. The SRC is screening the documentary Winnie to start a conversation about what it means to be in Bogoto and what the late struggle icon represents to the youth. The screening of Winnie sparked a national conversation about the late struggle icon Winnie Matigizela Mandela. Many South Africans voiced their anger and sadness at how the struggle veteran had been treated. The film was shown on the weekend of a funeral. Responses to it were remorseful. What will it take to shut you up so that we can release your husband? Who should we talk to? I said, who are you talking to now? The angry black woman. This stereotype can be traced throughout historical periods where women of color were oppressed, but it has been reclaimed through the likes of Mawini she affirmed her rage and used it to realize her goal, a democratic South Africa. 
guest speaker Londi Wemdambo uses the film to provoke debate around the notion of the angry black woman. She discusses how Mawini was discredited by the apartheid government, ANC and media. Ubu Mama Ubu Mbogoto is the power and strength of black women. During the event, the Rhodes student body discussed the effects of this term. The organizer of the event discusses the reasons behind the event. I wanted to continue the conversation and debunk the whole notion of black female rage, Umama Umbogoto. So that is what has triggered um, the response of um, watching the documentary in particular. Umama Mwiniwa is Pile Limbiloyake and the Epila true to herself. Um, and that was part of the disruption of apartheid is that she did. And I think that the other women that you're naming as well, they dare to think about themselves differently. The Black Women Rage event generated vigorous debate about Mawini's legacy and how she redefined the angry black woman. This is Dumelo Tamaha reporting from Rhodes. Now it's over to Fusion A Green with your sports and entertainment news. <laughs> Now for your sports news of the day. Last weekend, the Rhodes Football Club travelled to Butterworth to play friendlies. This was against Water Sisulu University and the University of Forte. The games were played in preparation for the University Sports South Africa National Football Tournament, which will take place from the 2nd to the 6th of July. The Rhodes Titans and Forte Tigers faced off in a basketball friendly on Friday, the 11th of May. Rhodes supporters showed up at Alec Mullins Hall in their numbers to support. The women's team lost the last quarter by two points. The final score was 23 to 25, while the men's team lost by 10 points with a final score of 24 to 34. If you're struggling to decide what to do with your downtime this week, we have you covered. Greek Sock is hosting a Coachella-themed day mayor at Rustic Root this Saturday, the 19th of May. There will be live performances from local artists from Rhodes University and Grahamstown. On other news, today is the third day of Disability Week here at Rhodes University. There is a program of events which will run until the 18th of May. On Thursday, there will be a keynote address by Richard Vergunst from Stellenbosch University titled, Making Invisible Disabilities Visible. On Friday, there will be a lecture on South African Sign Language. The full program can be found on the Rhodes University website and Twitter account. And that brings us to the end of today's show. Thank you for joining us today. You have been watching Makanda News. I have been Samantha Krolis. And I am Sinala Tugu. Catch you again next time. Goodbye.